It's a component of behavioral cha change. Thank you, Mark. You raised your hand, I think. Yeah, yeah. But Jason got to the point I was going to make, which was, I mean, I don't think no, no one's saying that a device alone is the intervention, but I think the device is part of a package and there's actually a pretty good level of historic evidence around, you know, sizable, well-conducted randomized controlled trials showing that devices as part of an intervention package for particular patient groups in primary care can be quite effective across the timescale that we measure in randomized controlled trials, which would be up to two years. We don't measure longer than that, so we don't know necessarily. So on the whole, we heard today that 200, I think the figure is 250 million people are using smartwatches or activity trackers. Thinking about the community out there, what do you think is the true potential of wearables to overcome serious uh, health behavior risks in the population, physical activity, poor sleep patterns, irregular sleep all over the place, insomnia and all these things, too much sitting. What is the true potential? Are we, uh, wearables is a recent phenomenon. We have to acknowledge that they have been around for 10 years. Fitbit released their first model in 2019, if I remember well. So we're talking about uh, less than 15 years. Is there a possibility that there is a, they are fad? It's a phenomenon that appears and will disappear from history because we will realize that they don't work. What do you think is the true potential of wearables to deliver, Andreas? I think it, it's got a massive potential, but I think it will be naive to think that it's just by using it for individuals to give individuals information about their sedentary behavior or what's being optimal or the advice, I don't think that per se will change those in need. I think we need to link it to, to, to other structural, uh, organizational measures in the society to promote physical activity and uh, healthy behaviors. So I think we need really to collaborate with also with other type of uh, research fields about how to make healthier cities, healthier jobs, healthier homes. So not only advice will make it. To understand their potential, to research it better in a more broader context, more multidisciplinary context. Uh -huh. um, so like Andrew said, I think the potential is uh, huge. Um, and if I compare to where we were at, say, 10 or 15 years ago, I think the physical activity field is now taken much more seriously by people outside our field than we were back then. Um, because always back then, speaking to other epidemiologists, they'd say, oh, physical activity is still self-reported. Nobody believes what people say. And there were very few real in our journal or publications in Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, et cetera, type journals. Um, Manos, you've been leading a blazing light in for us and, and, and others in the field then. Uh, because with the large-scale device studies, such as UK, Biobank, others, I think we've now got a much higher quality evidence base than we've ever had in the field. And from interacting with those outside the field, I think we're taken much, much more seriously uh, now. So then what would be the impact of wearables in future? I think it's around pure measurement. So if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So two particular areas. Uh, first is around strengthening our epidemiological evidence base. Um, I think we've got much stronger evidence coming out of, for example, Mark was talking about all well, cancer subtypes, how's activity associated with that. These large scale resources will really help us answer those questions uh, over the, the next uh, couple of years, really. Um, so, so large scale wearable resources interacted with electronic healthcare data sets and biobanks that will really improve our evidence base for guidelines. Secondly, then the use of those devices will be really helpful for clinical trial endpoints. Um, so you've got different candidate intervention targets, whether they be a, a, a small molecule or a behavioral change intervention. I think wearables can be really helpful then to, for endpoints to better assess interventions. But I don't think wearables will be helpful for behavior change. Um, they might be a component of it, as others have mentioned. I don't know, if you give me a hundred billion pounds to make the nation more active, I wouldn't give them a wearable. Like, build better cycle lanes and things like that. But so I think measurement uh, to improve our epi uh, evidence base uh, and clinical trial endpoints. Thank you. So and address the environment more than individual behavior through wearables alone, essentially. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, Mark, would you like to respond? 
Yeah, I, I don't think the picture is just as simple as that, uh, Abe, unfortunately, um, because uh, to change environments, uh, A, takes quite a long time. So the average road takes about 20 years to get a prison built. Uh, and so you can imagine our park cycle lanes are going to take some time to get built and require political will, therefore require people who want to use it before it's built. That's the reality of the world. So we have to start to change some level of behavior, even with small populations to advocate for that. That's one part of it. The other part is that building structures alone may or may not, certainly some of the evidence may or may not yield the population level behavior change. So just because it's there, you know, if you build it, they will come type attitude. So we, you know, as part of that broader behavioral package, so there are interactions between the physical environment and the social environment and the individuals, both their autonomy, broader socioeconomic uh, determinants of, of, of behavior and indeed of health. And so it's, it's a package at all those levels because the levels interact. They're not discrete determinants of, of either behavior or health. Thank okay, you. It may just piggyback and obviously it's been a little bit flipped into that with that last uh, comment uh, and you've obviously got the expertise yes. in that, but I, but I yeah, do very much think measurement is where wearables will have the greatest impact. Uh, generation of evidence, measurement uh, with a view to generating uh, better evidence. Thank you. Uh, Jason. So, so I think, I think I'm, I'm in between where Aiden and Mark are. So I think there's opportunity with wearables based on the evidence about new understanding about different physical activity patterns, for example, the Vilpa work. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity now to use a wearable in the way that we haven't used it before to say, well, look, what you need to do is do four bouts of two minutes of vigorous activity throughout a day. Can we use a wearable to support you to do that very specific amount of activity? So it might be a, tells you to do or records you've done it. And that might be attractive to a type of person who's not interested in doing 30 minutes of continuous activity. So there might be an opportunity to use that, use, use accelerometers to do different types of physical activity intervention than we've tried before. And all the really clever data to work out what different patterns and how things interact might enable us to use things in a slightly different way than we've done before. I think there's an opportunity there. We need to do trials to see whether it works better, whether people stick to it. Doing. I think there is an opportunity there that we, we haven't fully exploited yet. And we are forward to wait until we have all that evidence mentioned today before we kind of decisively recommend some form of intervention based around wearables, because I think the generation- We do trials. We do, tri we do the trials now. We, we've got an evidence to write, to write the grants to do the trials to say, does this work? And then if we find that it works, then you implement it. If you find that it doesn't work any better, then we don't. So I think there's enough evidence to say we can move beyond measurement and looking at the association between different forms of activity. We've got enough new data to say, let's do some trials to say whether prescribing activity using devices, and again, it would be involving behavior change people and, and trying us to do, think that best ways of doing it. Does this work better? I, I think we can do that now. Sure, thank you. I'd like uh, to hear everyone's view about the true potential of wearables. So Stephanie, what do you think? I was just about to raise my hand. One of the things that I think that wearables, the advantages that I think that they really offer are the potential to observe natural changes in physical activity over time that we can't get from traditional surveillance methods or, or question, you know, asking people, you know, annually or having them wear the accelerometer for seven days. So I think that the wearables do offer that as, as a great advantage and potential to maybe look at, you know, changes over disease course, over the life course, over changes to built environment. We'll have daily, you know, data on these folks. But the, the, again, the challenge is the wearables change over time, the algorithms, the comparability. I don't, it, I'm not sure we're there yet in terms of being able to use them as a surveillance tool in terms of consumer wearables. But I do think they offer a huge advantage in terms of looking at consistent changes over time. And I think that's one of the, the places I'd like to see the field move. Yeah, the question is, are they going to change the behavior of the population once oh. we have? Yeah, the systematic review evidence suggests they do result in small to moderate changes in physical activity levels. I'm not sure, again, over long term what those look like. Usually in clinic, when we use them, they are really good at raising awareness. But whether or not they actually change behavior, I'm not entirely certain. I think that they have the ability to change behavior if they start integrating context and perhaps providing personal feedback. Maybe in the future, you know, you, you'd like to go for a bike ride. Here's a great place for you to go with using integrated GPS, perhaps to, to point somebody to, to resources where they could be physically active. 
it would be great to see some integration of that. Thank you. Tessa, what's, what do you think? So just to clarify, your question is whether we think we're going to have behavior change or just in general, what are the advantages? The, the um, question is about the, whether wearables in general, in particular consumer wearables, 250 million people are using them all over the world. Let's forget for a second about socioeconomic inequalities in the, in, the, yeah. in the ownership of these wearables. For those 250 million people, do you think they are valuable tools to help them improve their lifestyle? So I think there are many, many advantages to wearables, but in terms of the behavior change, I don't feel like I comment more than what anyone else has already said. I do think it returns back to the people that are interested who, who already have a wearable, or probably those that are already interested in being healthy. And, and so I'm not sure there are real targets for behavior change. I think the other thing to think about is um, if we give people devices, what, um, and I think it's kind of been touched upon as well is. You know, that's also a requirement that people need to charge the device and they have to have a certain level of motivation. Even if we give them it, they have to ha have some motivation to con continue to wear it for a long period of time to, to do that. So, yeah, I'm not sure I can add regarding behavior change to anything anyone else has said, but uh, I'm interested to see how the field manages to overcome these challenges because they do on the surface seem to have huge potential. Thank you. And uh, Sari, would you have anything uh, to add? To what's been said? Oh, yeah, I, I must say that I, I also agree with the others. So I, I don't think it's a magical solution that can be used alone, but maybe together with other, other, not other types of intervention, it, it may be useful for some people. And, and we also know that not, not everyone are interested about this kind of gadget. So, so for some people, maybe for younger people, it, it may be of interest for a while. But I think the sustainability is the key. So the people lose interest. It doesn't matter that much these problems what the devices are given. So maybe there needs to be new features or, or games or something that the people interested and, and make it also fun. About the, so just about, giving the device and use it. How about the generation, the current generation of young people? So these people will grow up in a world where wearables are very common, many of them. I mean, there are lots of adolescents. You see lots of adolescents wearing uh, smartwatches. What is the potential for the young generation? And uh, what are the consequences of them being accustomed to all that technology, including wearables? Are there any hopes there? Be, be making better use of them? Futuristic question. Who wants to take it? Someone who has children, ideally. <laughs> Stephanie. I I would just say that I, I do have two children um, who have wearables. <laughs> it was their choice. It was not our choice to offer. They, they asked if they could have them. Of course, they know what mom does for work. But uh, I can say that one after a year no longer wears it. The other one does. And it actually uses it as a motivation in terms of how much. And he, he almost uses it as a reward to him, like a personal reward to himself that he gets very excited when he exceeds his daily goals of steps. Of course, he uses steps metrics, so it's a little bit simpler for him to understand. But it is phenomenal how many kids do have them and how they do use them. I think most of the time, it's not necessarily as a motivational behavior change tool. It's more of, a, it, of interest to know what I'm doing. It's a watch and it does collect a bit of information that I can share with my parents, but it's, you know, it's not necessarily something that's changing their behaviors. But I think that they are definitely going to be a generation that's accustomed to having more of this information at their fingertips. And they are certainly going to be used to, to getting it and understanding how it is affected by their daily behaviors, for sure. So I think they have more of an awareness around the devices. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's more of an appetite for these, even more moving into the future. And perhaps the, this generation will be more accustomed to the idea of the quantified self, measuring using devices all the time through their phone or extra devices. Jason, would you like to comment on the new generation? Yes, so, so I think they can support if people are already interested. If, if you're not interested, I'm not sure if they will start. I mean, for example, anecdotes, not data. If I'm not fit and I go for a run, I don't wear a device, right? When I'm running well, I put a device on because I want to know how well I'm, how well I'm doing. So you kind of, you're not going to use it. All, all, all the time, you want to use it to reinforce things that are positive. And I think different people are going to want things, want different things. Some people want when they're active, don't want it to be measured at all. So I don't think it's going to be something which which which, which works for anything. I think it's a, it's a tool that we can use alongside a whole bunch of other tools. 
do you think that they, do you think that the, the newer generations will adopt them better than current generations? Are, are are all these kind of ways biases in a way of using wearables uh, specific to our generation and older generations or younger people, new newer generations will also carry them? Is there a potential for for making better use of them? I, I think I think we don't know. I mean, I think people like devices and they like Twitter and they like Facebook and all these things. But I, 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 those things kind of have no downside. It's all it's all dopamine, isn't it? And I think one of the things with with physical activity is you might get a benefit down the line, but a lot of people, while they're doing it, are not, don't really want to do it. But they might feel the benefit down the line. A, a small number of people sort of like doing it. So I think it's it's different from all the other reasons people might use technology which just gives them a, a positive hit because for a lot of people it feels negative first and you might get a positive thing down the line so, so, so i'm not sure i'm not sure thank you uh mark and then tessa and then we'll wrap up okay briefly then the i, I think the question is saying that technology will stay static and we don't know what to, it's about what the, the adoption it's about the, the adoption of the technology by newer generations younger generations but the, but the technology won't be the same, so it'll be a different question because its purpose will be different. But I'm, I, I think the key to this is that the tech, you know, as the technology is at the moment, it can assist behavior change, but we're not implying that it assists behavior maintenance, and we need to dis disaggregate those two things. So the things that help us keep up activity are things like positive affect, where we reflect on the activity or we have a good experience in the moment. And anyone who's taken part in any activity, most of it's pretty. You know, at, at a vigorous level, most of it's pretty uh, negative affect is prevalent. You know, it's, it's not that much fun when you're lost in a gut. But the activities we enjoy that we reflect on are the bits that are generally social, which is why I say these individual characteristics interact and they're in a place and environment that we enjoy. So a pitch or a, you know, a club or something like that that we enjoy dancing in, whatever it might be, that is, you know, th that's the key. So th the wearable is only, you know, a, a screwdriver and a tool box, hammers and nails and all kinds of other things that we utilize as part of this day life. Thank you. Tessa, last comments before we wrap, wrap up. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to, to ask you a bit to, to give me in a 30 second answer. Uh, we're going to switch back to your, please wear your hat as a researcher. What would the perfect wearable device for research purposes specifically would look like? And I'd like to start from Aidan, because I'm sure that he's the, the person who's given it more, most thought than anyone else. The perfect research device or wearable device or wearable system. Feel free to be creative. It's got to be something we can deploy in hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Um, so I think probably more and more it looks like the consumer devices, and particularly getting those long within person trajectories. and. I think I feel as much as that would pay my heart, I would feel free to let go even of the raw data requirement within that. But maybe ideally, if there was a way to switch it on for random points of time, that it would collect some uh, raw data. So, so maybe I'm working together with industry then, so we, we could maybe have little switches on of raw data every now and then, but, uh, but getting most of the consumer uh, great offerings. Have you always thought that or Robert Harrell changed your mind today? <laughs> we, we've been in discussions. With oh, Robert, so you've been... Could we do something at real scale in some of our studies? Thank you. Tessa, your, the, your wearable, your dream wearable. Yeah, imagining no constraints. I think for me, the big thing I'm trying to wrestle with at the minute is the wear location and the convenience of the wrist versus the potential accuracy of the trunk or thigh worn. And if there was some magic way to have a really convenient acceptable monitor that could, could solve that problem. I think that would be my number one. And Aidan has already talked about my number two problem, which is the raw data versus storage capacity and, and that. So they would be the two issues that I'm probably thinking about the most. Excellent. Thank you. Sari, characteristics of your dream wearable? Yeah. If, if there are no budget, of course, brains. So I, I would like to have a... <laughs> I would like to have a multi-sensory device with not only measuring physical activity and sleep, but also the contextual factors. So something about the well temperature we already get, maybe about the air quality, noise, environmental characteristics. And, and if we then have smart people who can do these machine learning uh, things and, and create 
patterns and environments where people actually are or where they are active. That would be cool, I think. I think that covers it pretty much all. <laughs> so we, have, we have this device, I think, that the rest of the panelists wouldn't have anything to add, perhaps. Uh, okay. We need to wrap up uh, because we were running uh, late before the session. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank you once more for this very lively, excellent discussion. Really good, uh, interesting points. And I would like to hand it over now to Anne-Marie Koster, who will provide the final remarks of this today event. So thank you all again, and thank you to the audience who stayed with us until now. Thank you, uh, Manos, and uh, thank you, panelists, for a very engaging and interesting panel discussion at the end. So thank you for staying until the end. I won't. I promise I won't keep you that much longer, but in my uh, closing, I would like to make a few announcement and a few remarks about today's uh, meeting. I really enjoyed this two-day meeting and I hope you did too. I learned a lot and there's, I think, lots of food for thought. First of all, I want to highlight a few things from today's program. This morning or evening, wherever you are, we started with a session led by Manos, Mr. Matakis and Dr. Amadi. Manos announced that ProPass is actually now expanding to wrist-worn accelerometer, accelerometry, which I think is a very interesting endeavor and opens lots of more opportunities also for future collaborations. And he also thought about maybe the future next to the expansion of consumer wearables. We're not there yet, but from today's discussion, I think it's a reasonable thing to really start thinking about this. And Matthew highlighted or spoke more about the ProPass Unified Wearable Framework. And I think this is really important work to develop methods so that data from, in our case, thigh-worn data can be aligned with wrist-worn data. And I think this session was also really an invitation for collaboration, a collaboration on data, collaboration on methods. And again, uh, please get in, get in contact with us if you are interested. In the second session, Anna Donnelly, president of the ISMPP, spoke a bit about what ISMPB is and does and what they aim to do. And he nicely showed the synergies between the society and ProPass and where we could find each other. And we have already, yeah, we have an official partnership with them. Um, we have collaborated already and we aim to further nurture this collaboration in the months and years to come. Then the next session was uh, Robert Hurley. And Harold, and he spoke about, he gave his view on the wearable pre field from an academic and industry perspective. And I think that was really interesting. And he touched upon some of the thoughts and maybe prejudices we have as academics on how things are done in industry. And I think he nicely showed this, how this, how algorithms are being developed in industry, showing the thorough work that underlies it but also the limitations that it's not published, for example, and not shared with academia, which then limits the use uh, and collaboration uh, between the two. Between the two, And also he, he showed that algorithms are, are all the time changing. And at this point in time, it's not possible then to know the data that have been collected, which algorithm was used. So I think there is potential using these consumer devices and surveillance, but with challenges, and this was nicely laid out in this presentation. And I think it's very interesting to continue the conversation with industry on this topic. Then we had a break, and after the break, Jason Gill and Timo, uh, Tim Chico spoke about commercial wearables in population research and relating to the recently published AGSM editorial series. And Jason spoke about perceived versus actual physical activity, depending on how it's measured and what the challenges are then for future guidelines. And he spoke about some of the important challenges and the challenges of using consumer wearables. And this was also part of the panel discussion that we just heard. For example, that only a part, a selective part of the population is using these devices. So this comes also back to the work we have to do in low to middle income countries, for example. And this is one of the fields that also ProPass is trying to invest its efforts in. And an alternative could be indeed the use of mobile phone data, if we only think about steps. And also that could be an interesting alternative 
as the, the mobile phone use is much higher, uh, much uh, more used, uh, much denser use of mobile phone use. So that could be an interesting direction as well. And then Tim Chico gave his insight from a clinical perspective. And in his case on cardiology as an example, but I think it's showing that how physical activity levels decline before an event. And it would be uh, interesting to think about how we could use this as how we could use declining physical activity levels or trends over time in predicting outcomes or maybe even prevent outcomes. So this will be very interesting. And we heard in the panel discussion that there are differences between countries, but it's really interesting to follow this and to see how it could be used and implemented in, in healthcare. And again, we, we ended today's program with a very, uh, with an interactive panel discussion. Um, and I would like uh, again to thank uh, the panel members. Uh, so today uh, we had this online meeting. Uh, next year, we aim to have our annual meeting in person. Uh, which will be really nice uh, if uh, Mark uh, started showing the picture where we met in 2018 in Copenhagen and it's time that we meet again in person. Uh, so hopefully next year we can meet in person around uh, in Paris, hopefully around the ISPA conference uh, congress. So stay tuned for announcements on that. Before I close the meeting, I would like to thank a few people. Propas has a, a conference organizing committee. In there are Richard Pulsford, Herbert McDowell and Natalie Pearson, Sally Fenton, and Lauren Girard. But this year's or this annual meeting was really organized and led by Richard Pulsford. Thank you so much, Richard, in getting this good program and interest, interesting discussion and everything together. And he organized this together with Sarah Steiner and Samantha Rollins from the Sydney team. Um, thank you for running this event and it went flawless and uh, it, was a, it was a great meeting. So a big online, uh, online applause, I would say, for them. In, uh, in organizing this. And further, of course, um, I would like to thank also the speakers. Thank you for your excellent presentations. And I would like to thank the audience. Thank you for being here today and yesterday for attending this and uh, engaging with us in the discussions. I hope we see each other next year in person in Paris. And with this, I would like to close this event. Thank you and uh, goodbye.